PAFW family and friends, happy Friday. It is a behind the scenes class today, and I will be giving you your first character creation challenge for today. So my background is a movie theater, old movie theater. Um, and this is the movie theater that was used one of the settings um, that was used for the new film, Empire of Light, which was directed by Sam Mendes. Um, so the Oscar winner of the day, Coleman, and a young actor named Michael Ward. So that is our theme for today. Before I get to what you're going to look at today, Let's do a little moving and grooving, and then we'll get to our behind the scenes work for today, our video for today, and our character creative challenge, your first one of the year. So let's get to the moving and grooving the Brandy Irfango. <laughs> A hundred ships a day, no less sailors pass the time away and talk about their homes. And there's a girl in this harbor town, and she works laying whiskey down. They say brandy, fetch another round. She serves them whiskey and wine. They say the same brandy. You're a fine girl, what a good wife you would be. Yeah, your eyes could steal a sailor from the sea. Brandy wears a braided chain made of finest silver from the north of Spain. A locket that bears the name of a man that Brandy loves. On a summer's day, bringing gifts from far away, but it made it clear they couldn't stay. No horror was his home. They said, I said, bring me your fine Okay, guys, it is in Hollywood, it is award season. Um, it usually starts around, well, it's usually the first half of the year. Um, our first few months, first quarter, like about, um, for the movie awards, the Emmys are in September, but we have a lot of awards right around that first of the year. Um, we had the Golden Globes which are Tuesday. We were just Tuesday. The SAG Awards are coming up, and the Oscars, as of this recording, those nominations have not come out yet, but they will soon. So one of the big contenders this year is a movie called Empire of Light, that um, was directed by Academy Award winner Sam Mendes. Stars Africa Academy Award winner Olivia Coleman, Michael Ward, Tanya Moody, and the um the cinematographer was Richard Dickens and Colin first is also in this movie. So what we're gonna look at today in our behind the scenes, if I really love showing you what a little bit about what goes on behind the scenes of making a movie. Is we're gonna we get an interview where Sam Mendy, Tony Moody, Michael Ward, and um Rod Richard Deacon, the um the cinematographer, that the camera person, and Michael Ward talk about the film. Then we're gonna look at one where they break down one scene and what went into creating that scene. We're gonna look at those two first, and then we'll come back. 
I'll give you your first creative character challenge for the year. Were you intimidated to act alongside Olivia? Um, I wouldn't say intimidated. Um, I don't oh, feel. Go well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was intimidated. <laughs> No, for me, it was just, I was just really excited up until this point. I hadn't worked with anyone that, that was like an Oscar winner and, and stuff like that, you know what I mean? So for me, I just wanted to learn. I was just excited to, to learn and be around that energy. Phil. It's just... Static frames with darkness in between. Why did you feel now was a good time to be sharing this story? Well, it's not really just an ode to movie making. It's movie watching, movie showing, going to the movies. I think we all, when we were in lockdown and in COVID, fearing that this would go forever, that we would never be in this situation again being able to go through a wonderful ritual like Toronto Film Festival and seeing all these movies and just being able to sit with people in the dark and be taken on an adventure, you know. But it's, it's not just that. It's about how movies and, in the case of this movie, how words and poetry can take you out of yourself if you're um, in some way struggling. If you're struggling mentally, if you're struggling, in this case, you know, racially, um, it's a time of great upheaval, and for both the characters, the central characters, one of them is struggling with mental disintegration and the other is struggling to find himself in a world which is full of racial upheaval. And it's about the way that you can escape those things, that art can take you out of that, that art can give you a way through. What was the inspiration behind Olivia's character and why did you think of her for this role? It was very simple. I've always admired her. I didn't know her when, before I made this movie. And during the period of writing it, I was watching The Crown on television and she was just amazing. And everything she was doing was so translucent, so readable, so uh, every thought passing across her face. And I just thought, oh, that's Hillary. That's the character I'm writing now. First of all, getting a Zoom from Sam Mendes was so exciting that I would have said yes to any script that had turned up. The chance to play things I hadn't played before and a bit scared of it, which was quite exciting. And I just sort of knew, just from our Zoom conversations, that he seems completely, he'd be in safe hands, he really knows what he's doing, and it was a part I sort of wanted to play. Yeah, when I read it, I just felt like I hadn't seen a character like this before. Um, you know, someone that's just full of hope, got a lightness, you know, um, especially where I'm from, you know, that you don't really get to see stories like that. And I just wanted to be a part of something great, to be able to work with people like Sam, Roger, Olivia, Tanya, like, you know, um, and all the other amazing people that were involved. It was, it was special for me. I never thought I'd be able to do those things. So yeah, it was just exciting, exciting story and exciting people involved. And for me, those are the perfect elements to being involved in something. What I leaned into was the love story. I felt it was Sam's love story with the cinema and movie making, the experience, uh, the shared experience of being in, in, in this space together with other people and seeing the film, not just in the audience, but also as the filmmakers. Um, I thought it was a love story between the two, um, Michael's character and Olivia's character. I felt it was a love story between the characters of the film and movie making. So, and then of course my relationship with Michael as his mum. It was our kind of love story when you get to the point where you're letting go of your child and they are right at the cusp of leaving the nest, as it were. So I think that's what appealed to me in just leaning into the intimacy of that and trying to find all the intricacies within those energies. There's a little flaw in your optic nerve. So if I run the film at 24 frames per second, it creates an illusion of motion. What were some of the challenges in filming this movie? Uh, was always the biggest challenge, the weather. <laughs> no, there was a number of challenges, but you know, at first you think something is going to be incredibly difficult, like we did with 1917, but also this in its own way, because you had to find a theatre that had to really work for the script in terms of its magic and everything, and it had to be on a, the seafront, promenade, facing the ocean, so... I mean, it was a lot of prep with uh, Mark Pillsbury and I said, well, walking around different towns and searching for the right place to shoot. So, I mean, that was the biggest challenge for me. 
Was there something specific about the theater you found that you felt really made it work? Well, it was interesting because I think the theater we ended up shooting in, in Margate, was not what Sam had in, in mind originally because it was a theater in Brighton on the seafront. And we went to Brighton and it was a fantastic situation, but there was no interior because it had been turned into a casino. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> so then we talked about, well, okay, the interior, maybe we build it as a set because, you know, we were, we were kind of adamant that we'd have the real world outside the doors of the cinema. So then it was about finding somehow to get these elements together. We've all been on film sets. I don't know why every time you go, what? Yes. <laughs> and then you look around the corner, it's sort of held together with sticky tape. And, yes. But it's incredible what they did. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a strange magic about this cinema. You know, it's a big Art Deco palace built on the seafront and really quite a working class town. And it has a quite un-English feeling to it. I didn't want it to feel quaint and tiny. It has scale, you know, and what Roger says is right. I didn't want to build it. It didn't want it to feel like it was green screen. I wanted it to feel like it was a real place, but it still had to have magic about it. And that place gave us all those things. So you don't see the darkness. Is there a movie that you remember watching in theaters uh, where you felt uh, a, a feeling like that for the first time? I think the first movie that really, as a filmmaker, or as someone who wanted to make films or might want to make films in the future was a movie called Paris, Texas, a Vim Vendors film I saw as a student. Where it's the first time I felt there was a contemporary world that felt mythic, that felt vast and unknowable and beautiful and amazingly shot by... Robbie Muller and with a great script by Sam Shepard and, and it still remains the sort of touchstone movie for me. I've just remembered One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, I remember seeing that the first time I saw that. That wasn't a moment when I thought that's what I want to do but it just went, I couldn't stop thinking about it, still, I still think about it quite regularly but Breaking the Waves was, I watched when I was a drama student and that's the first time I went, that's the sort of work I want to do. You know, Emily Watson just, I'm not sure I could ever watch that film again. It, I, I cried solidly for about two weeks, yeah. For me, a film that kind of had an impact on me was Of Mice and Men, because we were studying it oh. in school. So, you know, we had to look at it very deeply and, you know, kind of breaking down scene by scene. And then you're really, like, you know, going over this, like these scenes, that like, intimately. And you know, like, for me, that was a, a good process. And I realized this is something I'd love to do. You know, I'd want people to study something that I've done. War game, I'm a little older than everybody else. <laughs> so my experience of the Cold War is a little bit more direct. But I want to say actually Peter Watkins' other film, Culloden, which is actually about the Battle of Culloden. And if people haven't seen it, they should, because it's an amazing piece of filmmaking mm. and still very contemporary because he reconstructs the battle on the real battlefield um, but he has modern day reporters reporting on it and it's fantastic use of the medium and I think I was watching that and War Game thinking this is what film could do. I think transformative for me is a, is a difficult question because I'd really have to sit and kind of go back uh, into my memory and go what's really changed me and so I was thinking what's an easier way to answer and I was like what, what's a film that made me cry and I cried solidly after Monsters Inc. Yes. I went, I saw it in a cinema in Stratford-upon-Avon <laughs> and I went to the ladies afterwards and I sobbed. Oh, I couldn't pull myself together. I found it such a moving, I don't know, the little girl and the monster. I can't, <laughs> can't. You've already been in the conversation around your performance. Is, is awards buzz something that you pay attention to or where do you keep your Oscar? No, it, Where do you keep your Oscar then? She brings it with her in a handbag to work. <laughs> just, and just, you know, before she'll just if I'm getting talk to about it. Sam, I don't like it, put it on the table. Yes, just put it out. Yes. Never stop yeah. talking about it. If anyone tries to sit next to her, you know, at lunch, she'll just put it uh, on the chair. chair. <laughs> <laughs> but does your Oscar that you already have have a home? Um, well, I, I do. <laughs> I actually, he lives in a cupboard because I'm a little bit embarrassed if people come around. I don't, I don't want it to look like, you know. Who do you think she is? I don't know. So it's really just for me every now and then. If no one's looking, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing happens without light. The central scene for me was always the scene where Olivia's character finally cracks. I found that very moving to watch, to 
put together, and I still I still find it upsetting to watch even now. Uh, so that that was a, a big thing for me, and it's, it comes at a crucial point in the movie. At the very end of the film, I think that both of them, both Olivia's character and Michael's character, go off into the future, changed by each other. I find that. Um, that's something that I, I'm proud of. Yes, that scene for me is the one I remember the most because well, we're allowed to say we did it twice. Yeah. Oh, well, so we did it twice. Yeah. So um, we sort of did it twice, didn't we? We yeah. did it. We, we added to it. Yeah, but I, I, I'll never know if I think we talked about it, but I can't remember. But so the second time we did it, it sort of was a bit of a surprise, and I'm so grateful that we got to do it again because I think I did a better job of it second time round. I think because I was thinking, oh my god, I must have done it badly, <laughs> and so the added adrenaline and the added nerves. And it, I was, I felt much better about the second one. I hope we deleted the first one. It's all gone. Okay, great. <laughs> Me and no, I just love watching actors. That's why I like operating the camera. That's why, I, <laughs> that's why I've been doing it for so many years. But you can feel that as well, I have to say, with Roger on the other <laughs> yeah, you, you can, can feel his support and, and love and respect. He yeah. just kind of radiates <laughs> it, <laughs> which is, so lovely, you know. So I always say this, this you know, uh, <clears throat> when Rogers loved something, he, he a squeeze of your shoulder from oh. Roger Deakins is it's... worth a thousand words. <laughs> oh my gosh, oh my gosh. <laughs> I go on and on and they're like, yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When he squeezes your shoulder, it actually means something. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize pigeons, did you know? Pigeons give birth, uh, well, no, they don't give birth, they have eggs, but there's always one male, one female. No, I didn't know Isn't that amazing? That Who knew that? I didn't. So Coco was the girl, Pops, her brother, was the one I fell in love with. Yeah. I am Michael Ward. I'm Olivia Coleman. And I'm Sam Mendes, and this is Notes on a Scene for Empire of Light. Ruth, don't go in, Norman's very particular. You stand at the bottom of these stairs. Michael's character, Stephen, has just arrived on his first day at work in an old cinema called the Empire Cinema. Olivia's character, Hilary, who's worked there for some years, is showing him around. And it's the beginning of an odd and unexpected friendship between the two people. Make sure you keep hold of the ticket stubs and bring them back to me so I can check them against admissions. OK, so when do we, you know, open up? Um, 20 minutes. Well, this... So where we're standing in here, in the foyer, is not real. <gasps> it was a huge hole in the ground three months before we got yeah. there, and then... It's probably a hole in the ground now. Yeah, oh my God, they've knocked it down. Yeah, it's all gone now. It's all gone. But it's just incredible. So, like, around little sort of corners of steps, it looks like there's been decades of shoe scuffs, but it's only three months old. I mean, if you lent on this, it did fall off. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> um, <laughs> just incredible and when you're inside it's so it's just underneath a tent but the Roger Deacon's genius lighting it feels like you're it was great. you can feel you know if it's a stormy day outside he's made it you know it's I was we were all in awe of it the whole time yeah. what was interesting is that the real cinema is three lots down so the exterior was real yeah. and it was a place called dreamland an old art deco palace built in the early 20th century staring out to sea but the lobby of dreamland we didn't really love so we constructed on an empty lot, three uh, buildings down from there, we constructed our own version of the lobby so we could look out at the same view, the same seaside and the same road and all the rest. What Mark Tilton, the production, the brilliant production designer had to do is to take a building that was derelict, a real building that was derelict, and build it up so it was a working cinema again, but age it, and then build something that matched the aging of that original cinema. So here you see the transition between the set and the real location. So we now step through the door. But it's three buildings down the road. But it's three buildings down the road, effectively. And a lot of this stuff that we see here was already there. The rubble on the floor, some of the old light fittings. But Mark very artfully changed the colour scheme of the whole place. So it had a feeling of water about it, almost as if when they step through this door, they go into a slightly different world. And it's a world that only they occupy together. You never really get to see anyone else in there. You they, don't. It's, you it's don't. Just... You don't. That's yeah. deliberate. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> oh, clever. Clever man. Something else happens here is that the music, which is by Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, changes, and there's something much 
dreamier and stranger about the score here than we've heard before. I didn't know the whole time that there wasn't actually a door here. <laughs> I, I, it, right <laughs> where Hillary's opening the door, there's nothing there. It's a wall. It's a wall. Like, this is, is carries on. This wall here is carried on there. And I didn't know until we went back in there to do like a photo shoot after we'd wrapped yeah. in that location. I was like, why did no one tell me this? <laughs> it's actually insane. Trust me, it was that. Ma- I couldn't believe it. I remember when we was filming as well. I'm trying to look for everything. Because obviously, <laughs> Stevens, you know, he's in, intrigued by everything that's going on around him. But there's so much to look at because it is such a complex um, place. And then Sam was just like, just focus on two places and just walk. Because <laughs> 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 it just, because I could just look everywhere. That's how like grand this place is. Best for last. Pigeons. <laughs> Can I talk about the pigeons? Slight fear in Michael's eyes. <laughs> 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 so. Michael, we didn't realise, um, says an awful lot about him looking after his pigeon, but uh, had a deep-seated fear of yes, just of pigeons just, or all just, animals? I just think all animals. All really. animals. And I waited till I signed my contract before I told Sam, because I didn't want to tell him, and he goes, I right, let's find someone else that's actually confident with pigeons. So I, I waited and I told my agent, I was like, yo, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. And then we was coming up with loads of ideas, like, you know, an animatronic pigeon, and. <laughs> hypnotising myself so I could get over the fear. But one of yeah. my first rehearsal days with Michael, uh, they said, oh, Michael's already working with the pigeon. He went, what? <laughs> and just went down a corridor and he went, hi! And he had a pigeon on his head. <laughs> and Her name was Coco. Coco. Yeah. You fell in love with Coco. I do. Wow. One of the things that Roger Deakins did to this room, and also Mark, was to subtly change the colour of it, the colour of the, of the windows. If you see the windows are slightly blue and yellow. There, yeah. there, and there. And it had a feeling when you're in there of being underwater. And when you, when you look out from this window, as you'll see in a minute, you can see straight out to sea, it's just the horizon line. And Margate is actually not as I originally conceived with the movie on the south coast of England. It's actually on the north coast of Kent. So it looks at the North Sea and the skies are quite different. The light is quite different to the more, the quainter and the calmer south coast of England. It's where JMW Turner painted all his famous landscapes. He said they were the most beautiful skies in Europe. And one of the things I love when you walk into this room is you look out onto this vast expanse of just gray sea and an endless space. And it is a remarkable building. It's just a... This always made me feel like we were walking into a Titanic. It was like a ship and you could yeah. see the sea and it was... Yeah. Rotting away. And Mark added all these odd bits of panels of, um, of mirror which bounced the light around. Yeah. And this old dance floor to give it a sense of history. But it really, when we walked in, was completely stripped out and totally empty. This is a scene in which um, uh, Michael finds, Michael's character, Stephen finds a wounded pigeon. And if you look here, you will see him waiting for it. And you will ask yourself, is that a real pigeon? And the answer is no, that's a CG pigeon oh. waiting for this very moment what to be seen for the first time. Well, he wasn't in this shot because he'd flown away oh. Oh. temporarily. Um, when he, Obviously, when his moment comes, he's very much there. Also, the, the sorry, I'm obsessed with the pigeons, but Pops <laughs> was the one on the shelf, not that one there. But when you go to get him, Pops was the brother of Coco. Coco was the one that Michael fell in love with. She was quite feisty. And Pops was the dopiest. Oh, so <laughs> sweet. And he sat on the shelf like that. And just Sam waited. said, can he face the other way? And they went, yeah. And they just moved. He just went, oh. <laughs> just moved sideways. This pigeon. I loved him. What a place. It really was beautiful. Yes, it still is. The story was mostly um, conceived in lockdown when we were all, I suppose, worried about the fact that we weren't going to be sitting in cinemas anymore, ever. And we were never going to have that experience of sitting in the dark with strangers and um, being transported. But it also, during lockdown, we were all left alone, a period of self-examination with our thoughts and um, the memories that bubbled up were memories from my childhood and my, my teenage years about living with someone with mental illness and also with the way in which my own racial opinions were formed during the early 80s, a period of real racial um, 
strife and difficulty and how much we had or perhaps hadn't moved on since then. So all of those things went into the, into the picture, uh, which is my first original screenplay. And I wrote the part of Hillary for Olivia standing next to me, and I was very lucky in finding the, you know, I, I have to cover his ears, but the beautiful and soulful presence of Michael Ward alongside her. So here they both are. Thank you. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I know, like I said, I show you interviews, I show you what's going on behind the scenes whenever I can, because I think it's really important to understand how much work goes in to creating a film. It's not just about what the actors do. What I love is the team effort, a room working together. So I really hope you enjoyed watching those two. Got a lot out of it. Okay, guys, um, we are now going to go to our character creation challenge for this week. All right, guys, so as we read, saw in the first part of the video, um, Empire of Light is about a old movie cinema, cinema, they call it cinema in England, movie theater, they call it the cinema in England, um, and the 80s and the story behind the characters around this movie theater, that's what it was about. So, for your character creation challenge, you gotta imagine that it's a theater in your small town, Right here, the, but let me show you the picture of an old rundown movie theater. All right, the movie theater has been in your town for years and has not been open for 20 years. All right, so what's happening if you're having a town meeting to decide what to do with the theater? So either you're gonna tear it down or you're gonna keep it and restore it. So you have the opportunity to create two, one character monologue, okay? Either your character is speaking at the meeting and thinks they should keep and restore the theater, or your character thinks the theater should be torn down and something that's built in its place. So again, get a choice of which character you want to play, all right? So do you want to play a character that says, look guys, this movie theater has been in our town for years. I, I remember going with my brother and sister when we were little, and I used to love it. It was so beautiful, it was so majestic. We can't tear it down. We need to use that fun to be sure the theater and what it could do for our town could be amazing. So again, that's a character that wants to keep the theater, or you could create a character that doesn't want to keep the theater, like this. Look guys, I, I love the theater too, okay? But come on guys, it hasn't been open for 20 years, it's an eyesore. We need to tear it down and build a shopping center and bring some economy and pump the money back into our town. We don't need to, who watches movies anymore either? We work about it online. We do not need this movie theater. We need to tear it down. Okay? So again, guys, the second step, there's an old movie theater in your town. Your town is having a town meeting to decide what to do with the theater. You create one monologue, either a character who thinks the theater should be kept and restored, or a character who thinks the theater should be torn down. Only pick one. So that is a character creation challenge for this week to create a monologue short the end to be long, either A, a character who believes the theater should be restored re and kept in this small town, or 
a character that the, the theater should be toned down, right? But that's what you, you have. Um, you can always, again, email me the tape at dejclass at gmail.com or text the video to 323 364 2478 to do by um next Friday the 2020th. So from now on your 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 videos will always be due the following Friday and this will be I'll go into our first spring showcase. Alright? So guys again if you have a question you can ask me um call or ask email me but again, that's your character creation challenge for this week. You get an email later on today about the character creation challenge. And uh, Ruben and Groovy, I won't be on Zoom on Monday because of the holiday. Um, but I should be in at the studio on Tuesday and Thursday of, the, of next week. And I'll be on Zoom on Wednesday. Um, to yourself for David. All right, guys, let's do some more moving and grooving and have a great weekend. Let me